Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher who investigates the unified pattern which appears to connect and explain all fields of science. So in this video I'm going to be talking about Marco Rodin's Abha Cipher, or variously called the Fingerprint of God and a few other things. Um, and this is the fundamental key to vortex based mathematics and the first thing we need to look at. So this video is the first part of a multi-part series that I'm calling Decoding Vortex Based Mathematics. And in this first part, we're going to be exclusively talking about the Abha cipher. So I'm going to give a little history and context to the cipher and uh, then methodically go through some of the patterns, ratios and geometries which it contains. So before we jump into decoding Marco's Abba cipher, uh, I wanted to give a quick bit of history of what this thing is and why it's important. So fundamentally, it's important because it's a symbol that happens to contain many unique and interesting mathematical patterns. And it also serves as a key to the later applications of vortex-based maths to the number map and to the torus. So you need to understand that this is all still an evolving field of science and no one really has all the answers as to the full extent of VBM's applications at all. Um, so this is just an attempt at an exploration so we can better try and understand and apply and verify VBM in all sorts of different ways in the long term. So from free energy to field propulsion, personal spacecrafts, quantum hypercomputers, understanding of unified physics and extremely efficient programming languages, just to name a few of the claims and the things that are already being explored. So after I explain the history and context of the Abha cipher briefly, uh, we'll dive straight into the patterns and the geometry and the ratios that can be found in it. Obviously, the first question most people will ask is how did Marco come about developing the Abha cipher and vortex based mathematics in general? So the answer is complicated. Uh, Marco decoded it from the Baha'i scriptures. And this sounds like a pretty vague explanation in the scientific world, but we need to understand this in the context that Marco is not the first genius to say he made his discoveries by decoding them from a sacred scripture. So Isaac Newton and Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci um, told similar stories when they were questioned about some of their discoveries. So I choose to take Marco at his word um, when he says he derived the other cipher by chanting the name of God and decoding the numbers from his scripture. Sure, that's how we got it. For skeptics out there though, um, you may find vortex-based maths and the patterns Marco has discovered interesting just based purely on their merit, uh, so it's still worth looking into. And for those who wish to find out more about how Marco decrypted these things from the Bible scriptures, you can check out um, the book published by Science to Sage, uh, linking, which, which I've linked to below, um, which contains quite a few of the quotes from Marco and the Bible scriptures on the topic. And the number nine represents, represents both God uh, and the golden ratio. And Marco claims it's the source of all other numbers. As a last little note there. And now we're going to jump straight in and see what patterns we can find in this Abha cipher. All right. So to form the Abha cipher, Marco draws a circle, places a nine at the top, and then he evenly spreads the other eight numbers around the outside of the circle. So up until this point, we're still just going on Marku's intuition. From here, we can start to explore the patterns which are present in the other cipher. So the doubling sequence. And this is the doubling sequence in the Mobius circuit, creating the one, two, four, eight, seven, five repeating pattern. So we take one and we double it. So one plus one equals two. And then we draw a line from the one to the two. So then we take two and we double it and we draw a line to the four. Then we take four and we double it and we draw a line to the eight. So we take eight and double it and this equals 16, which is of course not shown on the cipher. So this is where we need to learn the most fundamental function that is used in VBM. Uh, and this is the method of reducing numbers with more than one digit back to their digital roots or their mod nine. So in this example, we take 16 uh, that we get when we doubled eight. So eight plus eight equals 16. Uh, and then we take the two digits, one and six, and we add them together and that equals seven. So one plus six is seven. So therefore, if we reduce any multiple digit number 
using this method uh, will always obtain a digital root number of one to nine. So if we obtain a second two digit number, uh, we just repeat the reduction operation to find the digital root again. So for example, if we had 39, we would go three plus nine equals 12, and then 12, one plus two equals three. So carrying on with our doubling sequence around the upper cipher, uh, we know that the digital root of 16 is 7, so we continue the doubling sequence by drawing a line from 8 to 7. And then we double our previous number, so 16 plus 16 equals 32, and we reduce the 32 to its digital root, which is 5, so 3 plus 2 equals 5. So then we can draw a line from the 7 to the 5. And then we double our 32 and we get 64. We find that the digital root of 64 is one. So six plus six equals 10. One plus zero equals one. And we can draw a line from five back to one to complete our Mobius strip circuit. So we can continue this doubling sequence indefinitely though. So the digital root pattern will continue and follow the same pattern around the upper cipher. So one, two, four, eight, seven, five, and repeat. The doubling sequence of the 3 and the 6. So, according to Marco, the 3 and the 6 constitute a completely different system to the 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5. In fact, the 3, 6, and the 9. Um, but as far as the doubling sequence of the 3 and then the 6, uh, they have their own doubling sequence. So, if we take the 3 and, the and we double it, it's 6. And if we take the 6 and we double it, it's 12. And if we again use the digital root of 12 and reduce it so it's uh, 1 plus 2 equals 3 and then if we again double 12 we'll get 24 2 plus 4 is 6 and this pattern just repeats endlessly again so then we've got the doubling sequence of the 9 which has its own doubling sequence it's just unique to the 9 so the 9 alone um, only produces itself as its digital root when it's submitted to the doubling sequence and so we can see that laid out in the same way there. So then similar to the doubling sequence, we can perform a halving sequence in the same way on both our Mobius circuit, the one, two, four, eight, seven, five, and again separately on the three and six, and again on the nine. So this is quite a curious operation and it involves calculating the digital root of fractions, uh, which I don't believe most mathematicians would have done before, uh, just as we did with our whole numbers earlier in the doubling sequence. So if we start at 1 and we halve it to get 0 0.5, to find the digital root of 0 0.5, we simply add 0 plus 5 together. So our digital root is 5, and we can draw a line from 1 to 5. So now if we take 0 0.5 again and halve it, we get 0 0.25. So 0 plus 2 plus 5 equals 7. So our digital root is 7. So we draw a line to the 7. We can continue this halving sequence and tracing it on our Mobius circuit backwards, going from the 1 to the 5 to the 7 to the 8 to the 4 to the 2, and then repeating. And this is our halving sequence. And again, we can continue the halving sequence as we did with the doubling, and it will continue to follow the same pattern backwards around the circuit. So then we have the halving sequences of the three and the six. So again, the three and the six have their own halving sequence. And half of three is 1.5, uh, one plus five is six, half of 1.5 is 0 0.75, seven plus five equals 12, one plus two equals three, and so on to get a constantly repeating pattern again of three, six, three, six, three, six, and so on. Um, then we have the halving sequence of the nine, which is again, just unique to the nine only. Um, again, the digital roots of the nines halving sequence always come up as nine. So you can see this halving sequence here and the digital root of the nine. So the doubling and halving sequences are the first patterns that we can easily see in the other cipher. Another pattern we can find is what Marco calls harmonic trinaries or he calls it various other names and longer ones as well, but we're, we're going to stick with this one for the moment. And if we perform our doubling sequence again, uh, we get 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5. But this time we calculate the sum and the digital root of each connection. So 
for example, 1 plus 2 equals 3. You can see the 1 and the 2 connected. And or the 2 plus 4 equals 6. Or the 4 plus 8 equals 12. And then the digital root is 3. And then we've got 8 plus 7 equals 15 equals 6. 7 plus 5 equals 12 equals 3. 5 plus 1 equals 6. And this pattern repeats in this way, the sum always being 3 or 6. So once again, we've got this repeating digital root pattern of 3, 6, 3, 6, 3, 6. And I've just added an image there that's just uh, taken from Marco Rodin's book, Aerodynamics, uh, which just shows this in another form there. So we can also perform this same operation with the halving sequence. So taking the sequence 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.125, 0 0.0625, etc. So 1 plus 0 0.5 equals 1.5 equals 6, the digital root. 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25 plus 0 0.75 equals 3. Uh, 0 0.25 plus 0.125 equals 0.375 equals 6, etc. And so you can look at how that fits into the cipher as well if you like. So the next pattern we're going to look at is the powers of 10. Um, and if we look at our halving sequence, we'll notice that there is another pattern to be observed. So this shows the sequence of the power of 10 or by the increase of digits uh, with each step taken in the halving sequence. So the halving increases the amount of digits which with each step, as you can see written out here on the right. And then we can see if we continue to uh, repeat the halving sequence, the nodes of the other cipher become, and you can see those numbers written out there. I'm not gonna read through them all, but we can just see an increase uh, in digits or you know the number of zeros as we uh, increase, as we move through the halving sequence. So that's the powers of 10 pattern. Um, just another one we can derive from the other cipher. And, you know, this is obviously fundamental to both VBM and also the Abjad numerical system and mathematics, uh, as just pictured here. And the next pattern we're going to observe in the cipher is that of the polar number pairs. And this becomes very important uh, later on. So alternatively called the polar number mates. And they are eight and one, seven and two, and five and four. And so first we can see that if we match the numbers of the Mobius circuit horizontal to each other, uh, they'll make pairs which all add up to nine. So we call these the number, the polar number pairs. So each number becomes the beginning of another multiplication series, uh, which is based on the mirroring of the polar number pairs. And again, this will become really important later on when we're applying um, this information to the number map and to the torus. So to demonstrate these multiplication sequences, I'm just sharing this image of the torus shear one from page 207 of Science to Sage's book on vortex-based maths, uh, which demonstrates the principle. And again, you can find the link to this in the description and I encourage you to go check it out um, for a little bit longer and see all the patterns in here. And yeah, the, the polar number pairs will be really important later. And there are two other arrangements from which we can derive other series um, from the polar number series. But this is shear one and the other two are shear four and seven and we're not gonna look into this right now but you can find all of that in the Science to Sage book if you wanna take a look. And we will talk about this in other videos when we're dealing with the application to the number map and the toroid. So next we've got to talk about the uh, X, Y, and Z, and W axes and the zero point. So we may be wondering uh, about the center of the Mobius circuit at this point. This is the zero point, or what Marco calls the point of primal unity, and that has many, many, many names, but either way, this is the zero, um, which we may note is not situated at the center of the circle. Um, and for anyone watching a video on Vortex map, base mass, the zero point, the general idea of it probably needs no introduction. So this is where the point of the black hole or the dielectric portal is located on the cipher. So the zero point is located directly below the nine. And the zero point is the point from which all reality or spirit manifests from. 
and the spirit travels omnidirectionally from the zero point outwards, perpendicular to the Mobius circuit towards the nine. Obviously when I say omnidirectional, this can't be re represented in 2D really, and so on the other cipher this is represented by the nine above the zero point. So the path of the spirit from the zero point is always towards the nine. So Marco, Marco calls this path, uh, shown on the cipher in 2D between the zero point and the nine, uh, directly situated above it, the W axis. So it occurs on the fifth dimension, or the omni dimension, otherwise called counter space. So according to Marco, 5D eternal reality is entwined with 3D and its contingent physical reality. The fourth and fifth dimensions occur simultaneously. The poloidal, or the dielectric field, as it's otherwise called, or a fifth dimension is represented by the nine and the toroidal and magnetic field is represented by the three and six. So this can be a pretty heavy concept to get your head around. Um, it is for me and for anyone who hasn't considered what counter space is like before, I highly recommend checking out videos on the subject by Ken Wheeler. So what Marco Roden describes as the fifth dimension poloidal field, Ken Wheeler and Charles Bury Steinmetz labeled the dielectric field. Similarly, Marco's poloidal pinch point is what Ken refers to as the point of inertia or the dielectric portal. So they both refer to the magnetic field as the toroidal magnetic field. Um, anyway, just a few keys to help you navigate their differing terminology. Ken does a really good job at explaining what counter space is, so it can be really helpful to make the links between the work of him and Marco and gain some understanding from Ken's videos. But essentially, this W axis is not the X, Y, or Z axis of the 3D world. It's the axis of the 5D. So the spirit emanates omnidirectionally from the zero point, forever expanding through the pattern on its eternal path towards the nine. The zero point can also be considered as the all-seeing eye or portal or the eye of God. So this represents the all-seeing eye, the source of unity at all points playing over the numbers that make up the fractal pattern of the unified field as it continues its eternal path flowing over and activating the different possibilities that these infinite number patterns derive from the Abba cipher present, like a mathematical function as it expands through the fractal on the W axis. But enough on the W axis, uh, that'll need to be covered more in future videos when we apply uh, the use of the W axis to create the non dual non Cartesian toroidal number map coordinate system and apply this to our uh, VBM toroid model. So, the next uh, pattern of connections we can find in the other cipher is embedded within the geometric configuration of the Mobius circuit we've drawn. So, the Mobius circuit is composed of three different line lengths uh, the length from 1 to 2, the length from 2 to 4, and the length from 4 to 8. Uh, so, and they're marked out there. And we'll find that if we add any of the numbers linked together by these different lengths, the digital roots will all equal 3, as we show here. So 1 plus 2 equals 3, 4 plus 8 equals 12, digital root is 3, 5 plus 7 equals 12, digital root is 3. So they all equal 3. Um, but then we can also do the same thing uh, with the other three mirrored links in the numbers. Uh, but this time the digital roots of their sums will all equal 6 instead. So 4 plus 2, 5 plus 1, and 7 plus 8 will equal digital root of 6. And each of these lengths represents a different x, y, or z axis in the in 3D space, uh, along with time dependent component. And last but not least, I want to talk about expanding the Alpha cipher. Um, and whereas the rest of this presentation is based directly on Marco Rodin's work, this method is based off a method that I've only ever seen Tom Barnett show. And it's quite interesting, and I'll link to Tom's original video that shows it in the description below, so you can go and check that out because I'll only show a, a very small part of it and won't explore the patterns which he finds there. So first we draw the lines out from the zero point, passing through each of the numbers. And then we draw another circle, this exactly double the diameter of our first circle, with our compass point centered at the zero point. And then this time we space out 80 numbers evenly around this second circle with a nine again centered above the zero point as usual. We can then find our Mobius circuit again in this new larger circle and also the triangle which connects, connects the, or the arrow which connects the three, nine, and six. So we can continue to expand the other cipher continuously in this way by performing the same operation as we did the first time. Um, and so next we 
would double the diameter of the second ring and then place 36 numbers evenly around it and we can draw the Arbor Cipher again in a new expanded version of the same pattern. And Tom describes the lines between the numbers or vertices as scaling quantities as they radiate from the center outwards. Each direction has a specific value to be added when moving out from one ring to the next. And he provides some key scaling directions in his video um, and also kind of zooms into the fractal and yeah, he shows quite a bit more on that. Very interesting to check out. Um, and that's as far as we're going to go into that in this video. Um, so I encourage you to check out Tom's video and uh, yeah, explore this more. And there are other patterns which we can find in the other cipher and I'm still exploring and cataloging them all. Uh, and there's a bunch of other geometry we can fit into it and explore too, but it's still a little bit above my head. Um, yeah, there's a few things I know about and probably some I don't. So if you know any other patterns not mentioned in this video, then just let me know below. And if we find enough that I've missed, I'm happy to do another video to add them. And in future videos, I'm going to continue to break down vortex-based mathematics, VBM, into digestible parts. And this will include uh, a part on the number maps and what patterns they contain, how they're made up. Uh, and then finally, we'll explore how the number maps are applied to the torus skin and see what further patterns we can find. So from there, I'm hoping we'll be at the stage where we can release some of our initial details and results of our practical experiments. Uh, but needless to say, studying all of this so intently has inspired many ideas that I plan to pursue. So remember that all of this is done free and open source, and if you got something out of this video and you can uh, afford to donate a little or a lot to keep my research going, it would be really appreciated. It doesn't just take hours to do this stuff, it takes weeks and months. So I hope you got some valuable information about vortex-based maths from this video, and remember that it's only part one of a series, and so there's only so much I could fit in it, so hopefully a lot more to come. So to remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you can want to catch the next parts of these series when they come out. Thanks for watching.